So this class is called Forensic Pathology. But depending on who you're talking to, uh, it could also be referred to as medical legal pathology. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. Those two words are interchangeable. And really, I'm just going to give you a few different types of definitions today and talk to you a little bit about the different fields of forensic medicine and forensic pathology so that you can kind of keep things in your head a little bit. So the word pathology, this is really um, the study of diseases. Now, we're not going to study just regular old pathology. Uh, if you want to study regular old pathology, that's a different class I teach in the spring called pathophysiology. So that's not this class. This class is all about forensic pathology. Okay. Now when we talk about the word forensic, forensic means anything that relates to the law. So now we have this problem, this disease, this malfunction that's happened to this human being because somebody shot them in the head, and obviously that relates to the law. And so we refer to this as forensic pathology. So something caused some malfunction in a human being, and now we have this legal problem that's made this person ill. Okay, so this is also forensic pathology, can also be called medical legal pathology. So this is a branch of medicine that applies medical science to the field of forensics or to the law. Now keep in mind if you're taking a bunch of notes that these are on your PowerPoints that you can download. So if you miss anything, you can catch up on the download. And one of the big deals that we're going to talk about a lot is investigating and determining what we call the cause and manner of death. So we'll talk about what does cause of death mean, what does manner of death mean, and how do we figure that out when we see this person who has been killed. Okay, so death investigation. Very cool, lots of people want to do it. Um, you know, you see this stuff on CSI, right? And this is a big, big problem, especially for law enforcement nowadays, because CSI is a lie. It doesn't work that way. I mean, I, my mother, she loves CSI, right? So she calls me up, and she's like, oh, my gosh, I saw CSI do something the other day. Why don't you do this? And it was like, it was a CSI about bloodhounds. I didn't even know they had that. I have bloodhounds. Okay, we'll talk about them more later because they're wonderful. And uh, somebody took a jar and they like waved it through the air and they put a lid on it and then they gave that jar of whatever to the bloodhound and then the bloodhound found the person. I'm like, well, we don't do that because it's a lie. It doesn't work. You can't actually do that. Okay, so. Um, the big problem, especially with death investigation, is CSI makes it look like you've got this one really smart person who goes out with a badge, and that person goes to the crime scene, and they take all the pictures, and they write up all the reports, and they make all the measurements, and then that same person runs into the laboratory with all the stuff, and then they solve the crime in the laboratory, and then that same person goes out on the street and arrests the person, and then brings them in and does the investigation, and... It doesn't work that way. There's like a whole bunch of people that do this. So for instance, let's say somebody gets killed in Victorville, okay? There's no CSI person running out there to find out what's going on. The first person out there is a lowly cop. And they're like, well, holy crap, another dead person. And it depends on the department. Now, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department is a bigger department, so they have a few more resources. So the cop makes a phone call, and out comes the little detectives. And you have detectives that take care of a certain kind of crime, like maybe burglaries, and you have another group of detectives that take care of murders, and not every detective takes care of everything. Now, you want to be a homicide detective because there's money. Tons of overtime because you live in San Bernardino County. They have plenty of murders here. Okay, so you gotta make some good money. You're never gonna sleep, but you gotta make some good money. So the detective comes out and goes, Yep, 
dead person. Okay. So now the detective is going to call out the CSI people, or what you call the forensic specialists. Now, here's what the forensic specialists do. They take pictures. They collect stuff off the ground, off whatever. They don't touch the person. Not allowed to touch the person. They're not the person people. There's a person people too, okay? A people, whatever. Anyway, dead person people. So nobody can touch the dead person because nobody, that dead person doesn't belong to any of these people yet. You can't touch them. So the forensic specialist is going to come out. They're going to take pictures. They're going to do measurements. They're going to pick up evidence. And then they take it back to the police department and they log it in and they do nothing else with it. That's it. That's all the forensic specialist does. And then along come the forensic scientists. And these people are super duper specialized people. You've got certain forensic scientists that just do fingerprints. And you have other forensic scientists that just look at bullets. And other forensic scientists that just look at boot prints. And others that just look at tire prints. And others that just look at glass. I don't know how they do it, but they do, and they actually like it, okay? And that's all they do. That's all they do. So that forensic specialist has left certain types of evidence that they collected with the different forensic scientists who now tell you all the stuff you need to know, and who they're going to tell is the detective. All that information is going to go into a report, and the detective's going to get that report and then the detective investigates. So we're going to talk about how these death investigations really happen. And there's not like one CSI guy who's done it all. It doesn't happen that way. I have a friend who, he's a police officer in Las Vegas, and uh, there was a gentleman who had been murdered, and they were having a very difficult time trying to solve this murder because most murders go unsolved. The majority of them go unsolved. and. Um, so the family was very, very irate, and they were just making all kinds of complaints, and they finally somehow got into uh, my friend's office, who was a homicide detective, and uh, they're like, we know that you aren't going to help our son who's been murdered, and we know it because we watch CSI Las Vegas, and we know how you people help other people, and we're sure you're not going to help our son because he's black. <laughs> now, that's a very, that's a very special case. You've got to be careful what you say, but it's very hard to convince those grieving parents that you don't have CSI Las Vegas in your police department. That's in Hollywood. And it doesn't really matter who their son is as an individual. They don't have those kinds of fabulous resources. I mean, you see these things on TV where you plop somebody's face into some computer and three seconds later that person pops up, you know, that they got off of a video. It doesn't happen like that. You don't have that kind of beautiful facial recognition. You can't pop a bullet into some computer program and know exactly which gun that came from someplace in the world. It doesn't work that way. So we're going to try to clarify some of these CSI things because even if you're working in the medical profession, you may find yourself on a witness stand too. And you're going to have to realize that those people in the jury, they watch CSI. And you're going to have to somehow get this stuff across to them in such a way that they're actually going to buy what you say. Because you can't just give them the details and think that they're going to get it. They're going to understand. Uh, I was working on a case one time where the guy was a serial arsonist. And uh, he had burnt over 90 buildings down in the city of Riverside. And the last building was an apartment complex, and there were several people who had died in that fire. And they were able to find him. As a matter of fact, my bloodhounds were able to find him. And so uh, I was part of the testifying for the case and everything. And he was found innocent. And I mean, they had so much evidence against this guy, it was just frightening that they found him innocent. Well, after a court case, you can talk to the jury, okay? And so the district attorney took the jury aside and said, can you please tell us why it is that you found this man innocent? And every single one of them believed that he was guilty. 
But they were trying to teach the city of Riverside, and this is what they said, we're trying to teach the city of Riverside a lesson because we all watch CSI and we know how they investigate arson cases and Riverside did not investigate as good as CSI does and so we want them to learn so we let this guy go. These are the kind of people you're typically working with in a jury because these are not the people who are smart enough like you to get out of jury duty. <laughs> okay? So you just kind of have to sort of work with that and uh, figure out how do you get this message across so they're not looking at you like you should be CSI. Um, if they came up and they told you that, wouldn't that make room for some kind of retrial or...? Yes, it did. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they did get a retrial out of that. Yes. And uh, he was found guilty with the next jury. But it did help them to figure out how to better give the evidence to that next jury. So yes, luckily it did do that. And they were very, they were very positive about it. We just wanted to help the city so they could do a better job the next time. <laughs> they weren't trying to punish. They were very positive, but that's exactly what they did. So death investigation in the uh, really. It was used um, in England, and then the United States brought to our country the same techniques that the English used. And so in England, they used a death investigator that they called the coroner. And coroner in Latin means the crown, okay? We do have coroners in the United States, but most of our investigators are not the coroner. Okay, so just to let you know, it's a bit different here, although we do have coroners. Now, the coroner, to this day, still has the right to arrest people. How freaky is that? You're at a crime scene and the coroner can arrest you. Now, in San Bernardino County, it's not so freaky because the coroner is actually the sheriff. So they are the same person. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense usually because typically when we think of the coroner, we think of the coroner being a doctor who performs the autopsies to look at the dead bodies. But most of the time, that is not the case. Most of the time, the coroner is a paper pusher. They're the ones that kind of make sure the whole coroner's office runs smoothly most of the time, not always, sometimes it's different, most of the time the coroner is not a medical doctor, most of the time the coroner is a police officer of some kind. That's typically how it's always been. So who, uh, like forensic nurses, do they work with the coroner? No. You have, okay, so a forensic nurse is usually contracted by police departments or by hospitals. So you usually have your own separate business. So you can be a nurse anywhere and then also be a forensic nurse and you usually have your own separate business and then you contract with local police departments, local sheriffs, local hospitals and they'll call you in as needed to look at different things. And then when you work in a hospital, the hospital will also know you're a forensic nurse. So if let's say there's a rape case that happens, they'll call you in to help to collect evidence for that rape case. Because a forensic nurse also is trained in how to better testify. So you become what we would call an expert witness. So you don't want just any old nurse to go in and collect that evidence. You want somebody very trained to do it. So we'll talk about that more as we go on. So the coroner was able to call what we call an inquest. Uh, the coroner can still call an inquest in the United States. And so what this is, is the coroner, it's not a, a trial. Uh, it does happen in a courtroom, but the coroner basically gets kind of like a little jury together and a judge and says, I think this guy is guilty. And then the judge can say, okay, from this inquest, looks like uh, we're going to arrest the guy and then we'll go to trial. So the coroner is able to take evidence before the judge. So here's the other thing that happens. So again, let's say I have a dead person laying on the street in Victorville. You'll have two different groups of people 
coming to look at this dead guy to try to solve the crime. One of those groups of people will be the police department. The other group of people will be the coroner's department. And the coroner has their own detectives. And then the police department has their detectives. So you have two separate groups of people. Now, in San Bernardino County, we don't use the coroner's detectives quite as often, but if you work in Riverside County at every homicide, the coroner's detectives and the police detectives are at every homicide scene. And Riverside is amazing. Even the district attorney's office is at every homicide scene. So they really are serious about solving homicides. So the coroner, the name of their detective, is actually a death investigator. So the police department, their detective is a homicide detective. The coroner's department detective is the death investigator. And if you want to be a forensic nurse, you can also become a death investigator for the coroner's office. There's only two groups of people in California that can be a death investigator for the coroner's office. One, a registered nurse, to a police officer. So if you decide that you want to work for the coroner and do death investigation, you have to either be a registered nurse or a police officer to do it. A lot of registered nurses don't do it because in California they don't pay as good as working in a hospital or having your own contracted registered you know, forensic nursing group. So the coroner's office is going to perform autopsies. And autopsies, the word autopsy means to see with one's own eyes. This is the autopsy. Sometimes you'll hear people call an autopsy an anti-mortem. Or, I'm sorry, a post-mortem. So post-mortem means after death. So autopsy means to see with one's own eyes. some things that can be done anti-mortem. It just means prior to death. So right now you are in the anti-mortem state. Okay, so if we're not going to have a coroner, we're going to have a medical examiner. Or like San Bernardino County, we're weird. We have a coroner and a medical examiner. We're different. Uh, Riverside County just has a medical examiner and no coroner. So it just depends county by county, state by state, how you want to set it up. You can either have a medical examiner, a coroner, you could have both. But medical examiners are always medical doctors too. So a coroner could be a medical doctor could be a police officer, could be just plain old voted in. So like I knew a coroner in Mississippi who used to be the garbage man and he ran for the coroner and was voted in. Woo but remember Typically, your coroner does not perform any autopsies. They're the people who are just sort of running the business part of it. So you could have the garbage man who ran his own garbage business, and maybe he's really good at business, so he can be your coroner. Your medical examiner is always a medical doctor. So sometimes your medical examiner can also be the coroner. So they're the medical doctor, but they also do the paperwork and run the business. And they may also do autopsies. 
A lot of times what the medical examiner will do is because they're like the big head honcho, they'll hire a whole bunch of other doctors to be performing autopsies depending on how big the city is like New York. They have one head medical examiner who has also slashed the coroner and then they have about a hundred doctors who come in and do autopsies all week or month long depending on how many casualties there are in that city. So the first city who started having medical examiners was New York City. And then it started to spread and so Maryland said, okay, we're not going to have just coroners anymore. We're going to put medical examiners in there because we want to have doctors in charge of all these autopsies. We don't want to have the garbage man in charge. We want doctors in charge. So they actually got rid of coroners. They don't even have coroner offices anymore. They just have the medical examiner who's totally in charge. They do all the death investigation. So again, depends on the state you're in. Sometimes even within the state, depends on the county that you're in, uh, whether you're going to have coroner, medical examiner, both of them, who knows. Any questions on all this confusion so far? You got it all? Good. Okay, so what does the coroner slash medical examiner, what are they allowed to do? What's their jurisdiction? So they're going to come in if it's a sudden or unexpected death. So if grandpa hasn't gone to the doctors in the last five years <coughs> and dies in the back room, the coroner will probably do an autopsy. <coughs> Excuse me. If it's a violent death, homicide or suicide, if it's an unattended death, and what this means is the person has not seen a physician for more than 20 days prior to <coughs> death, okay. nobody else saw how the person died, <coughs> they're going to do an autopsy. If it's a contagious disease, or if it's an occupational disease, <coughs> and they want an autopsy because there's probably going to be a lawsuit. Now, I can tell you in some of the counties in California, uh, the police department and the coroner's office don't have a lot of money. And so what happens sometimes is, you know, grandpa dies in the back room, but he hasn't seen a doctor for more than 20 days. And uh, the police officers are not allowed to do this. This is illegal, but they will declare it a natural death and have somebody come and get the body and the person is buried and no autopsy is ever done. And that is not unusual to happen. So you have a lot of things that potentially could be homicide and no one ever knows. So again, we have both coroner and medical examiner in California, county by county, it's different. So, so far across the U.S. there are still more coroner systems than there are medical examiners and again most of these are controlled by the Sheriff's Department. Now some people have said that that is sheer unadulterated corruption. Because why would it be bad for your Sheriff's Department to control the coroner's office? Why? They could get away with a lot. <laughs> they sure could. They absolutely could. What if you had a corrupt sheriff's department and you have deputies who are killing their wife because they don't want to have to pay the divorce alimony and then the sheriff's department controls the autopsies that are going on and all of a sudden it doesn't look like homicide anymore, she just had a heart attack and died. So there are a lot of people who say that the police departments should not control the coroner's office because there could be corruption. I'm sure that doesn't happen in San Bernardino County though. <laughs> the federal government has their own system. We're not even going into that convoluted mess. So usually coroner's elected, maybe appointed by the sheriff's department, 
could be maybe a physician, so they would typically be a coroner slash medical examiner. And it all depends on the county or the state. Your medical examiner, okay, so anybody in here ever thought they wanted to be the medical examiner or a forensic pathologist? Okay, because if you do, it's going to take you a few years to get there. So first of all, to become the medical examiner, this is what these guys have to do. They have to become a doctor first. So that means they go and get four years of their medical. bachelor's degree. They go to medical school for four years. Then they usually do a residence or an internship for two years. And then they're going to do a residency in the medical examiner's office or the coroner's office for typically six years. And then once they're done with that residency, they'll become a full-fledged medical pathologist or forensic pathologist and they can become a medical examiner after that. So it takes them a long time to get to this position. So the medical examiner is going to visit the death scene, depending on the county we're talking about, responds to the death to do investigation, reviews what the police find, that information, and then also performs the autopsies. And by this way, sometimes instead of calling them autopsies or postmortems, they'll just call them posts. So they'll perform posts. And then they'll order if there needs to be extra tests done, maybe we think the person's been poisoned, they'll order toxicology tests, things like that. And then once they're done, they're going to write a report, and that report is going to go to the district attorney's office to say, if they thought it was homicide, suicide, natural, whatever it may be. Then their big deal also is to provide the cause and manner of death. So we'll talk about that too. How did that person actually die? So usually the kind of deaths that they need to investigate would be violent deaths, suspicious deaths, sudden unexpected, uh, if there's no physician in attendance, death in custody, that's a big one. You want to make sure that one is investigated so nobody gets in trouble. Uh, deaths during or after medical surgical procedures. That's also another big one. Okay, so if you're the death investigator for the coroner's office, uh, it's a really cool job. So what you're going to do is you're going to carry a gun. Even if you were a registered nurse, you get to go to the coroner's academy and you're going to have a badge and you're going to have a gun. And your job is to investigate just like the police detectives will investigate to see how this person died, who this person is, uh, who killed them, all that kind of good stuff. So I'll give you an example. I have a friend who's a death investigator. And uh, he is given this bone, a single bone. It's the bone in your upper leg, your femur. They find a human femur bone uh, in Morongo Indian Reservation. That's it. They don't find anything else. So they hand him the bone, because cops are like, we're not investigating this. <laughs> so they hand this death investigator at the coroner's office the bone, and they say, figure it out. What happened? Well, luckily for him, the guy who owned this bone also had had a hip replacement, um. which means that the top or the head of the femur was made out of metal. Now, anytime they give you that metal, there's stamped into it a serial <laughs> number. So he looked up the serial number. And lo and behold, the serial number was of a man who was under witness protection. Oops. And this guy who had been willing to testify against some mobsters in New York. And the last time he was seen, somehow the mobsters figured out where he was staying and people across the street had seen him abducted by certain people, put into a car, and never seen again. Now they never found anything except that one bone, but you can probably rest assured he <laughs> didn't survive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they were able to arrest the two people who had abducted him and they 
they put them on death row for killing this guy in California. So there's certain things the death investigator is able to do. Uh, the death investigator will also go to the home of families to let the families know that their loved ones have died. That's probably the hardest part of that job. Um, my friend says it's always super hard because the people get mad at you for bringing that news. It's like, you know, kill the messenger. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, you know, you go into these houses to tell people that their child or their loved one has died, and they get very, very angry at you. He said he went into a man's house one time to tell him that his son had died in a really bad car accident. And the father looked at him and said, what car was he in? And he said, well, you know, he was in this Mustang. He said he thought he was going to have to pull his gun on the father because he just got really red in the face and he was super angry. He said, and then the next thing he knows, the father is just screaming these curse words at his son for destroying the father's Mustang. He didn't care that his 18-year-old kid was dead. He didn't care that the 18-year-old destroyed his Mustang. It's like, so you just, you never know how the situation is going to come out. And it can be very dangerous, and people will react very unusually sometimes. It's an expensive car. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm glad that you understand him. <laughs> uh, so there, uh, this is everything the death investigator does. Goes to the scene, helps to look at what's going on, and try to figure out who the deceased is, how they died, that kind of thing. And then, of course, they're going to report to the next of kin and to the police department what they find, the district attorney's office. Now, death investigators, I told you, they can be registered nurses. Uh, they can be former police officers. They can also be, believe it or not, trained morticians, which seems really strange to me. You want a mortician as a de death investigator, but they can be. Uh, they, we don't hire very many of those in California. But you have to take PC 832 class, uh, which is basically different ways to arrest people and knowledge of the law. And then you have to take the coroner's academy, which is uh, about a six-week academy, so that they can teach you how to carry a gun. Most of the death investigators in San Bernardino County are retired police officers. So we have crime scene technicians or crime scene investigation, which these are our CSI people. Uh, and they are usually hired by law enforcement, but they are not cops. They're just civilians. And again, remember I told you that these guys are the ones who take the photographs, they diagram, they collect evidence, they can recover fingerprints. They're at the scene gathering all the information, but they don't do investigation. As somebody said they thought they wanted to be Forensic specialist, is that? Okay, so this is basically what a forensic specialist does. Most of your forensic specialists in San Bernardino County are hired from within. So get a job as a secretary, wait till the opening opens, and then have all the qualifications. I kid you not, that's how most of them get in. So you lateral in that department. Very rarely does the sheriff's department hire from without. They almost always hire from within. And a lot of your forensic specialists in the sheriff's department were secretaries or dispatchers before they got to this position. But you want to be able to take pictures. You want to be able to collect fingerprints. You want to be able to know how to collect and handle evidence. So if you're taking all those classes, you'll be ready to apply for that job and to lateral into the position. The criminalist is the one I told you, is also considered the forensic scientist. So these are the guys who are going to look at the bullets and the fingerprints and try to figure out what it is that that crime scene technician collected for them. And they work in the laboratory. Now if you are thinking of being a forensic scientist or a criminalist, you need to go to Cal State LA and get the master's degree in criminalistics. So you get your bachelor's degree in anything you want, biology, chemistry, 
sociology, doesn't really matter, and then you get your master's degree at Cal State LA in criminalistics. It is the best school on the West Coast, and the really cool thing is both LAPD and the LA Sheriff's Department built their labs, their police labs, on the campus of Cal State LA so that all of the students immediately can start working as forensic scientists for Cal State LA. You pretty much have a job once you finish that master's degree. It's really awesome and you learn everything right there in the LAPD laboratory. So it's a pretty, pretty cool deal if this is something that you're interested in doing. And there's a whole bunch of other kind of forensic investigators. <laughs> Question document examiner. Oh yeah, I mean, people who are experts in all kinds of things. I get called fairly often, hey, would you go testify for this or would you go testify for that? And uh, so you don't really have to have any kind of degree in forensics, although I do, but you don't have to. They might call you up. Uh, I, we have a teacher here who, she's a botanist. And I'll tell you a little bit later about a case that she was on, but it was all about leaves. And how did the, I'm not kidding you, how did these certain leaves get into the bed of a truck where a dead body was because those leaves didn't look like any of the leaves on the trees anywhere. So she was able to tell them what kind of leaves they were, where those leaves should be growing, and then they were able to kind of backtrack to approximately where this guy actually had been killed to figure out who ended up killing him. And so she testified about leaves. She didn't have anything to do with trying to solve who the murderer was or anything, but she helped the police to better understand. And so you, you could call her a forensic botanist now because she <laughs> testified about leaves in a murder trial. I'll also tell you about a forensic meteorologist. <laughs> That's a funny story. <laughs> but the guy testified about what the temperature of that day was. So we have the forensic pathologist, which is your medical examiner. The death investigator works for your coroner's office or the medical examiner. Your crime scene investigator is usually your detective that works for law enforcement. And also you have your forensic specialists who are collecting evidence, taking fingerprints, that type of thing. And then your forensic specialists, which are your scientists, your criminalists. Okay, let's get started. So definition of forensic evidence. Anything that can be used to determine whether a crime's been committed. Now, remember, sometimes this evidence exonerates people. So it doesn't necessarily, you're not necessarily collecting evidence to convict someone. You may be collecting evidence that exonerates people as well. So your job is not to convict. Your job is to collect. And the job of the jury is to convict. Uh, and by the way, if you are thinking about becoming a police officer, be really careful with that, that you don't think that your job is to convict people. Your job is simply to arrest. If you think you're there to convict, you're going to have a really short career because it's going to burn you out fast. So sometimes the evidence is going to corroborate witnesses. Sometimes the evidence is going to show you witnesses are lying. And by the way, uh, your mantra typically when you're working in forensics is if their lips are moving, they're lying. Mm -hmm. Even the good guys lie for some reason. I don't understand. I'll give you a really easy for instance. Two guys on a bus. They don't know each other. There's a whole bus load of people. This is in downtown San Bernardino, of course. And the two guys, somehow, they get into a fight with each other. They both pull out knives. They both start stabbing each other. One guy ends up stabbing and killing the other guy. Now, there's a bus load of people. None of the people on this bus are related to either of the individuals. None of the people on the bus know the other individuals. One, the guy who kills the other guy gets off the bus and runs. 
And so they called me up and said, can you bring your dogs out and can you try to see which way this guy ran? Maybe you or your dog can tell us where the guy is. So I get to the crime scene and uh, the police said, look, we've interviewed all of the witnesses and I'm going to tell you right now, all the witnesses say that the bad guy ran west. Okay, good to know. Get the dog, the dog goes east. I'm like, you stupid idiot dog. We've got 20 freaking witnesses that say the guy went west. And you're a moron. So I start the dog again. She goes east. I'm like, what the heck? I was so angry at this stupid dog. I actually called one of my kids up and said, bring a different dog. This dog is a moron today. <laughs> so we get a second dog out. And dog on, that dog goes opposite direction of all the witnesses and after that I'm like well okay maybe I should trust my dog this is a little weird so I let the dog trail we went down the block around the corner into a church parking lot and there was a guy hiding behind a bush 20 witnesses who have no relation to these two guys all lied I still don't know why to this day Maybe they like all hate cops or something. I don't know. But they all said the guy went west when he actually did go east. So sometimes you got to be really careful that even the good guys, maybe they were scared, but they didn't want to say anything. I don't know. Sometimes they don't tell the truth. And there's really no reason why they shouldn't have told the truth. Uh, and then, of course, your evidence could help you to identify who the victim is, as well as the perpetrator. And then sometimes this evidence is good to get a confession. By the way, are police officers allowed to lie to you when they're trying to get you to confess whether you committed a crime or not? Absolutely! They're the best friggin' liars in the entire world. They get taught how to lie. They were born lying to their mom. Okay? <laughs> they just love to lie. You can't believe a word they say. Okay? That's why if you become, if you get under arrest for any reason, your response to a police officer is, have a nice day, I want my lawyer. <laughs> I love police officers, but if they come to my front door and say, can I come in, my answer is no. <laughs> if they say, can I ask you a few questions, I say, Probably, but I don't necessarily know if I'm going to answer it. I'm very cautious with every police officer I talk to because they have an agenda and so do I. And it's usually not the same one. Their agenda is to get what they want and mine is to get what I want. And they very rarely mesh with each other. So I recommend you only answer the questions you have to, although you may have to pay for a lawyer after that too. But that's okay with me. I love to give them a hard time. Some of the types of forensic evidence are called direct evidence. Direct evidence is probably the worst evidence you could ever use in court because there are things like eyewitness testimony. And most eyewitnesses get it wrong. There have been a whole bunch of studies done on eyewitness testimony, and they say between 75 to 80 percent of the time, eyewitness testimony is 100 percent inaccurate because people get stressed and you know what stress does to you and have you ever done this have you ever gone to, into a grocery store realized you never look the teller in the face have absolutely no idea who that human being is you walked in you did your business and walked out and if I were to say to you can you describe what that person looked like you probably couldn't a lot of people you know you're just in your own world doing your own thing thanks bye see ya and we don't necessarily have really good, you know, perception of what's going on around us. And then, of course, direct evidence is also confession. And a lot of people confess to crimes they don't do. So you can't necessarily believe confessions that people give you. And sometimes they confess to a crime they didn't do, and sometimes they say they didn't do a crime that they really did. And so these are not very well uh, evidence, really good evidence to present in court. Circumstantial evidence is really the stuff we use in court. So this would be like fingerprints and hair and fibers and all that stuff you see in CSI. Now here's the thing, 
what you're going to do in court is you're going to try to tell a story. And the best storyteller wins. Okay? So if you ever have to be, you know, if you're ever arrested and you go to trial, you sell everything you have, you buy the biggest, the baddest, the best attorney you can possibly get, because the best attorney wins, hands down. Look at OJ. You can kill two people, and there's no doubt from the forensic evidence that that man did that. And then you get off scot-free, and there's a whole bunch of people that do not believe that he killed his wife and Ron Goldman. He has people convinced. But he had some of the best lawyers the world's ever seen. And that's really smart. And that's what it's all about. You're going to try to build a story, and you're going to try to convince the jury that your story is correct. Or you're going to try to convince the jury that the police story is wrong. And you want a great lawyer to be able to do that. So forensic evidence can't find and convict a criminal unaided. So you have to have investigators to do this. And there's a lot of different weapons that detectives can use. And I don't mean guns. I mean there's different clues. There are different ways to find this. We're going to talk about some of these clues that you can find on the body and that type of thing as we go along. We've already talked about this, so we can just go through here real fast. So, this is Black's Law Dictionary, and this is like the Bible for the legal system. And Black wrote this dictionary in 1968, although it's been updated since then. And this is the definition of death, the cessation of life, the ceasing to exist, defined by physicians as the total stoppage of the circulation of the blood and cessation of vital functions consequent thereof, such as respiration, pulsation, etc. Now that was the definition of death in 1968. Basically, if you stop breathing and your st heart stops beating, you're dead. It's a little bit more difficult nowadays because in 1968, they couldn't measure what your brain was doing. And now we can. And so this is a real simple definition of death. And we have now way more complex definitions of whether somebody's dead or not. So... Here's one of the definitions of death, another one that they came up with called cellular death. This means that your cells are dead. <laughs> That's basically what they're saying. Now this one's hard to measure. How do you measure whether, whether a cell is dead or not? And usually you measure it kind of like our other definition. The heart isn't beating, there's no blood flowing, the cells aren't getting oxygen or nutrients, and so they die. So this is kind of, sort of, we don't use this in forensics. It's just too hard of a type of death. So here's another one. Clinical death. Okay? So clinical death is the cessation or stopping of respiration and circulation. But if you're clinically dead, you might still be able to be resuscitated. So let's say you die in a hospital and then they come in with a crash cart and they can get you back to life again. You were clinically dead for a couple of minutes, but they shocked you, got you breathing again, and you came back to life. So with clinical death, you may be able to resuscitate the person. Okay, so here's another one, something called somatic death. This is the irreversible loss of personality. Being unconscious, you're unable to be aware of or communicate with one's environment. You're unable to appreciate any sensory stimuli. So if I tickle you, you can't feel it or it doesn't really mean anything to you. Or to initiate any voluntary movement. Now this one is a really controversial definition of death. Now, I don't know how many of you remember this, but there was uh, this lady who was in a nursing home in Florida, 
Um, this was, I don't know, maybe about eight years ago, maybe less than that. And her husband said, she's dead. And her, her mom and dad said, no, she's not. And the husband's attorney took it to court and said that we are saying that she is somatically dead. That she has no personality, that she's not able to move, she can't respond to any stimuli, so therefore she's dead. Even though her heart is beating, she was on a respirator, but if they took her off the respirator, she would still be able to breathe, just not uh, with as consistent of a rhythm. Her brain was still front functioning. She was not completely brain dead, what we would consider brain dead, where the brain is uh, zero functioning. And the courts agreed with the husband because they went into her room and they tried to get her to smile and to react to balloons and music and everything and they could not get any facial expressions from her. The court agreed with it. They took her off a respirator. It took her about eight months to finally die. But the husband won and the day after she died he remarried. And the parents kept saying, please don't do this. We're paying for her hospital room. We want to care for her. But the husband wanted to remarry, and he didn't want to have to go through a divorce. So very controversial issue. But the judge agreed. The judge agreed with him because we do have this definition of somatic death, and it is on the books. Now, there is also brain death, where the brain is irreversibly damaged and there's no brain function whatsoever. This includes the brain stem. Now the brain stem, if you remember, this is the part of the brain that controls respiration, that controls heartbeat, uh, controls a lot of the intestinal digestion processes, and without this brain stem uh, functioning, we can't stay alive unless we're on a machine keeping us alive. Most of the time when a judge is going to declare somebody dead, they're looking at brain dead as the real definition of death. Brain death sometimes is referred to as a persistent vegetative state. So if you've ever heard somebody, oh, well, they're a vegetable, okay, this is also brain death. This, so this is permanent damage to the brain. However, in this case, the brain stem may not necessarily be damaged. So everything else is damaged. They have no personality. They, they have no ability to understand what you're saying. Many of them are deaf. Many of them are blind. Uh, but they don't necessarily have to be on a respirator. Now, people who are in persistent vegetative state, because most of the brain is dead, you'll also see their body really deteriorate over time. And so what they usually die from is that deterioration. So if we're going to say somebody is brain dead, typically we say we look at them, okay, they're in a coma, uh, they have no cerebral responsiveness, that means the brain is not responding. Apnea means that they can't breathe without a machine. Their pupils are fixed and dilated, so if I shine a light in their eyes, they don't move, the pupils don't move. Uh, they don't have any reflexes. Uh, if you look at uh, an EEG, which is an electroencephalogram, which is the thing that looks at how the brain is functioning, it's just a flat line. You don't get any blips on the line at all. Uh, in California, it requires two neurologists to say that per somebody is brain dead. So you have to have two different doctors to sign off on brain death in California. So on a death certificate, what has to go on there is cause and manner of death, which we're going to talk about. But that's like the really big deal on a death certificate. What is the cause? What is the manner of death? Also, you want to have on the death certificate two kinds of causes of death. A primary or an immediate cause of death and a secondary cause of death, if you possibly can. It gives a little bit more information. So primary cause of death is the cause of death 
And usually it has a sequence of events in this cause of death. So I'll give you some examples. So for instance, the primary cause of death was hypoxemic necrosis of the brain due to exsanguination, due to gunshot wound to the abdomen. Okay, so here's what this means. Some dude got shot in the gut. And when he was shot in the gut, he started to exsanguinate, which means he was bleeding internally. And because he was bleeding internally, blood couldn't flow to his brain. And hypoxemic means there's not enough oxygen going to the brain. So the brain went through necrosis, which means it died. So he's shot in the abdomen, he starts bleeding internally, can't get enough oxygen to the brain, and so his brain dies. He has brain death. So this is the cause of death. Gunshot wound to the abdomen, which then caused bleeding internally, which then caused brain death. So hypoxemic necrosis of the brain due to exsanguination, due to gunshot wound to the abdomen. Secondary cause of death includes conditions which are not necessarily related to the primary cause of death. So for instance, maybe this guy who got shot in the abdomen also had uh, emphysema because he was a big cigarette smoker, so he had emphysema in the lungs. Or maybe uh, you know, a woman who committed suicide also had uh, arteriosclerosis in clogging in her arteries. So this is something that maybe over time would have killed them if they hadn't have been murdered or if they didn't commit suicide. So they put that stuff on there so the family knows about what's going on. So cause of death is the reason someone dies. <laughs> Just saying. Proximate cause of death refers to an underlying cause of death as opposed to the final cause. So the original underlying medical condition which initiated a lethal chain of events culminating in death. So our guy who had the gunshot wound to the abdomen, who exsanguinated, who then had brain death. What was his proximate cause of death? Gunshot wound. That was the original thing. He wouldn't have been brain dead if he hadn't been shot in the guts, right? Immediate cause of death. This is what kills a person, but was originally precipitated by something else. So, what was the immediate cause of death? It was necrosis of the brain. So, the immediate cause of death, the final thing that actually kills them. The final thing is really what you're going to say is the immediate. The proximate is what starts it off. The immediate is the final thing that kills them. Okay, so mechanism or mode of death. An abnormal physiological state that pertains at the time of death. So, for instance, were they in a coma? Did they have heart failure? Cardiac arrest? Um, maybe they were hemorrhaging, maybe they had septicemia, blood poisoning. This is the mechanism or mode of death. So the mechanism of death describes the specific change in the body that brought about the death. So it's a really big one that we usually don't put on a, uh, a death certificate. So, for instance, the mechanism of death in the guy who got shot by the bullet would be that he is hemorrhaging, and due to the hemorrhage, there's loss of blood, and that loss of blood volume causes blood pressure to drop. And when blood pressure drops, then there's not enough circulation, and that circulation causes a decrease in oxygen, which then eventually causes necrosis of the brain. That's the mechanism of death. They're not going to write that on a autopsy. So. You'd have to like look that up if you wanted to know. <laughs> the manner of death. This is the circumstances surrounding a death or how the cause of death came about. Okay, so for instance, was it a natural cause? Was it unnatural? So was it an accident, a suicide, a homicide, or questionable? 
Okay, so this is what we call this. Manner of death is Nash Q. Natural, accidental, suicide, homicide, questionable. Now, by the way, sometimes questionable can also be undetermined, but usually they'll write questionable on the autopsy forms. So our guy that got shot in the gut, what kind of manner of death do you think he had? Probably wasn't natural, because the gunshot wound, right? Okay, but could it have been an accident? Yeah. Yeah. Could it have been suicide? Sure. Could it have been homicide? Absolutely. So unless you know more, what would you say it was? Questionable. Because you can't determine because you don't have any more information. So until you got more information, you'd probably put questionable on the autopsy certificate. So pretty easy. We know natural is pretty much anything that would normally kill us, like you know, cancer, old age, that kind of thing. Some kind of disease would be natural. Accident means <laughs> I didn't mean to kill myself, but I'm a klutz and I fell off that bridge. Okay. Uh, suicide, obviously we know death by our own hand. Homicide, death by another. And then questionable, I don't know. <laughs> 